Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Listen, we serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. Amen. I want, I want to kick this off. I've, I've, I've asked Pastor Charles to speak on today. And I said, find one of the ministers to go behind you. And I want to say something, if I could, just for like five minutes. I want to, I want to, I want to read something. I want to go back. And I just need five. Somebody say five. I just need. <laughs> Amen. How many of y'all came here expecting something? We're going to do it. We're going to do it in this order that when, when I get finished, Eric, you prepare yourself to come on up. Amen. And you go right in on yours. And then Charles is going to close us out. Amen. And I believe that God is up to something. Ooh Somebody say when God is up to something. I, I want to go back. I, I know Pastor Charles read it. I want to go back to that St. Mark's 11 and 22 just for a moment. I want to show you something real quick because some of us, we need to catch what we've been missing because some of us, you'll just repeat out what the pastor say amen, or whoever's reading it says, but you got to understand when you start receiving this word for yourself, I'm going to read this real quick. St. Mark's 11, verse 22. We read the scripture early, Pastor Charles read it, and I just want to read, I just want to read through it just one more time. I just want you to catch something today because it's more than just coming to church believing God for something and getting pumped up for the rest of the week. It's one thing when you do that, but it's another thing when you believe him for yourself. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. And if, if, I, if, I, if I were to just, just, just put a little small topic on this, Auntie, I will put, put some weight on it. <laughs> Look at your neighbor saying put some weight on it. And, 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 and the Bible reads as follows. I'm just going to read it. Read a few verses right here. It says, and Peter, re and Peter calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou curse is withered away. Jesus then goes in and begin to talk. And he says, and Jesus answering and said unto them, so it was Peter bringing into remembrance, but Jesus, I'm going to speak to all of y'all. This ain't just for Peter, but he says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, said unto them, have faith in God. Look at your neighbor and say, have faith in God. He said, for verily I say unto you that whosoever should say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Now listen, I want to show you something right here. God was showing me this while Pastor you was reading this. He said, look, there are some people that are afraid to speak for themselves. There, there, there are some of us in this room right now, we, we are afraid to speak for ourselves. So God said, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I, I love to do, I love to pray for my children and those that can't speak for themselves. Because here's, here's, here's the thing right here. Here's the thing that if, if we stop praying for our children and our loved ones, hallelujah, then the enemy is just going to wreak habit. Somebody say praying. Hallelujah. He says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall now doubt in his heart, but, somebody say but, shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. Hallelujah. See, it's, it's what he's saying is that if you believe it, then you must receive it. Hallelujah. If you can cast it, 
You got to believe it. Hallelujah. I, I, I can speak to my, my, my auntie and my grandmother right here. They're great fishermen. Hallelujah. When y'all go fishing, y'all don't expect not to catch anything, do y'all? Y'all expect to catch something. Amen. And sometimes when you go, you may got to wait on what you're going to catch. That's why at the same time, you got to put some weight on doubt. You got to put weight on doubt, hallelujah, because the enemy of God want to come right in your mind and say, you're wasting your time. You're not going to catch nothing. You're wasting your time. Ain't nothing going to happen. But I serve a God. The Bible said, they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. I don't think some of y'all hear me yet. I don't think some of y'all hear me yet. I don't think some of y'all hear me. Hallelujah. Just a couple more minutes. It said, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And should not doubt in I believe that those things which he said shall come to pass. And he shall have whatsoever he said. How many of y'all waiting on something? Y'all waiting on something. Come on, I need to say, I, I know there's more people here waiting on something in this place right here. Lift a hand if you waiting on something. Lift a hand, hallelujah. I want to show you something right here. He shall have whatsoever he said. A closed mouth won't get fed. You have not because you ask not. Now, haven't y'all been asking God for something and still waiting on it? Hmm? Be honest with yourself. Amen, amen, amen. Because I've asked God for something and I'm still waiting on something. I ain't got everything I asked God for. Come on, somebody. How many people got everything they asked God for in this room right now? Raise your hand if you do. You got everything you're waiting to, you, you ask God for? Amen? Hallelujah. I'm God to do a few things. Hallelujah. And here's the thing right here. If I'm just repeating what the pastor is saying, but not speaking for myself, ain't nothing going to happen. Hallelujah. How many of you came in here for a jump start today? Come on, anybody need a jump start? Anybody need a jump start? Hallelujah, hallelujah. So here's, 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 here's the big catcher here, is that you can't get that jump start that you need if there's no cables. But I'm going to show you something, Grandma. I remember my dad didn't have no cables. I want to show you something. So he went in the house and he broke two old fans' cords off them. And he took those cords and he twisted them together and connected them to the battery to jumpstart another car. I want to let you know something right here today that it don't matter what you got. God said he would jumpstart you in a bad place. Hallelujah. God said you may be broke, busted, and disgusted. God said he'll jumpstart you in the old with your back up against the wall. Hallelujah. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. Some of us need a jumpstart. Our money is funny and our change is strange. And we need to God to give us a boost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, everybody standing. Everybody stand. We're going to get ready to receive Minister Eric. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If I could ask if, could you get the musicians for me, please? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just put your hands together. Come on, put your hands together. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Eric, come on up here. I want you to stand right here. I want to, I want to bless you right there. You, come on up. Come on, give God praise. 
Hallelujah. Stand right there. We, we, we're going to point your hand right here toward Derek. He, he told Pastor, he said, Pastor Charles, I need an earpiece. Hallelujah. I said, we got an earpiece for him. Amen. The Bible teaches us and tells us to study to show ourselves what? Amen. And I want everybody that came expecting a word from God today to point your hand right here. Because after Eric speaks, Charles going to speak. But if the Holy Ghost speak, how will you through him like never before? And we don't get a chance to get it. Charles, Charles know the protocol. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So God, I'm asking that right now. Somebody say, Lord, set us on fire. Lord, set us on fire. Lord, set us on fire. Now somebody give God praise. Amen, amen. Come on, somebody give God praise. Amen. Come on, y'all. That was good for me, but we got to give God some praise. Come on, y'all. Let's give God some praise. Yes. Anytime a pastor get up and they tell you a lot of times that they, they said, I'm just going to be up here for five minutes. I mean, they know they always say that and they'll be up here a little longer. So we're not going to be, be, be before you long, but I don't know how long long is. Amen. <laughs> First and foremost, give God the praise and the glory. I want to thank my pastor for this opportunity, him and First Lady. And let's ask us to continue to pray for them, continue to pray for the house as one. And I just want to thank you for this opportunity. I just want to pray for a second. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just come to you now, thanking you, giving you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. Lord, you are wonderful. You are omnipotent, Heavenly Father, Lord. You are loving. You are caring, Heavenly Father, Lord. Your grace is sufficient. Lord, we actually just to cover this house right now, Heavenly Father, Lord. Lord, we actually, Heavenly Father, Lord, to bless our man, our shepherd, and first lady of the house, Heavenly Father, Lord. Bless them mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and financially, Lord. Continue, Heavenly Father, Lord, to broaden our territory, Heavenly Father, Lord. Continue to work in us and through us, Lord. Know now, Heavenly Father, Lord, as I prepare to do what you have called me to do, Lord. Lord, as I decrease, Heavenly Father, Lord, you increase. Let no one see me but see you, Heavenly Father, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 I have a similar story to what Pastor was saying, and I asked him for this mic because, y'all, I like to talk with my hands a lot. I'm kind of like Pastor Charles. I like to talk with my hands and do a lot of illustrations with my hands, so holding a mic kind of gets in the way. But I had a similar uh, story to like what Pastor was saying about his mother. Because I had a mother, it was six of us, four adults, two that was teenagers, myself and my sister. May she rest in heaven. And my mother made a sacrifice to went and bought Sears. Y'all remember Sears was on North Avenue in Fond du Lac? Y'all that's from Milwaukee? And she made a sacrifice and bought me my first bike, my first red bike. You know, she worked at a nursing home and was saving, you know, food stamps. And I know that she made a lot of sacrifices like your mother did in order for us to, to get us that bike. She got me my first red bike from Sears and Robach on Fond du Lac and North Avenue. So when you talked about that, it brought tears to my eyes as well as it did yours. So I, I love my mother. May she rest in heaven also. Amen. Amen. But let's get to the uh, assignment that I have today. Coming out of Galatians, out of the fifth chapter, we're going to go through uh, 1 through 12. And what we're talking about here is Christian liberty. Talking about being free in the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to start reading this, and I'm not going to ask no one to stand because it's something on inside of you that tells you when the word is being read, it's going to push you to stand automatically. Amen? Stand. Amen. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. 
You have been in, uh, entangled from Christ. You have been estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor circumcision avails nothing. But faith worketh through, through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, I still preach, and I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who troubled you would even cut themselves off. And I added, God would say, before I do. Amen. The word has been read. And I'm going to title this message, uh, You Got to Go Back and See the Manufacturer. Amen. When the first talking about here in the first six, six verses, we're talking about Christian liberty, about standing fast, about not being persuaded to fall and fall, fall up under a different faith. You know how sometimes we get different faiths come to our door? Like we'll have maybe the Muslims or we'll have uh, Jehovah Witness come to our door. And if we don't know the word, they may persuade us to leave what we already know is the truth and to follow them. But that's why you got to know your word because sometimes somebody will come to your door and persuade you to follow something else. So God is saying here, I'm going to jump right to it. He says, who, who, you ran well, who hindered you from the truth? Sometimes it may not be somebody else. Sometimes it could be your own thinking. Sometimes we get distracted by other things, by other people, and we fail to follow what we already know is the truth. Sometimes it could be a substance. Sometimes it could be a person, a thing, where we get distracted and it gets us away from following what we know is right. There is a little bell that goes off when you're doing something wrong that's going to tell you, look, you know that's not right. Why are you doing that? So the Bible is saying here, God is saying this, you ran well, who hindered you from following me, following the truth? He said, this kind of persuasion doesn't come from me, who, who, he who called you. So my question is, if you're going to follow something else, who is it that called you? Who called you that's going to make you go and follow something else which you know you've been following for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, a day, and you know it's the truth, but then you allow something else to come and persuade you to follow, to go do something else. See, when you start following something else, you get out of character, as Pastor always talks about our character. We get out of following the truth of what we know that is true. And so when you get out of that way, then you got to go back and see somebody that knows how to fix it. And that's the manufacturer. Because, see, a lot of people say, I hear people say when they fall from grace or, or they fall from the church and they stop following what the truth is, they like to say, oh, when I get myself together, I'm coming back to the house of the Lord. Well, how many know that you can't get yourself back together? Amen. You didn't make you. You the one got yourself in the situation that you're in because you chose to follow something that was not true. You allowed somebody to persuade you to follow you to do something different than what you was already doing. So now that you're in this situation, now you're saying, when I, that's the bad word right there, I, when I get myself together, then I'm going to come back to the house of faith. Well, you can't get yourself together, and that's why I titled this message, you got to go back and see the manufacturer because... The manufacturer is the one who created you. So when you get in that rut and when you get down and when you've fallen from what you know is the truth, you've got to go back and see the manufacturer. Who is your manufacturer? Is it Jesus? Is it Muhammad? Or is it Abdullah? Whoever it is, you've got to go back and see your manufacturer. I know that all our manufacturers are Jesus. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen? 
Amen, amen. We got to go back and see the manufacturer because he's the one who made us. He's the one who put us together. He's the one who shaped and molded us into what he wanted us to be. So you can't get yourself together. You got to go back and see the manufacturer and he can look at the blueprints and see what's wrong. See, sometimes you have a vehicle. You can't take the Mercedes Benz to a Chrysler dealer and tell him to fix it. You can't take a Cadillac to a Chevy dealer and tell him to fix it. You can't take a Lamborghini to a Buick dealer and tell him to fix it. You got to go back to the one who made it because they know exactly what to fix. They know how to fix it because they made it. Same with us. When we get out of character and get out of wrong, get out of doing things that we know is wrong and don't get out things that we don't are doing right, we got to go back to Jesus. You can try mama, but you're going to have to go see Jesus. You can try daddy, but you're going to have to go back and see Jesus. You can try drugs, you can try alcohol, but when you get done, you're going to have to go see Jesus. You can try your siblings, you can try your brothers and your sisters, but when you get done, you're going to have to go back and see Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the key. You can't do nothing without him. He is the fixer. He is the motivator. He is the creator. You got to go back and see the manufacturer. And when he looks at the blueprints, he can look and see, well, maybe the starter is out. Or maybe the transmission is out. And he can go in and fix those things and bring it back to where you need to be. Amen? How many know they've been, how many have been in some situations like that? Where you had to go back and see the manufacturer. Where you had to go back and see Jesus because Jesus is the only one that can fix you. I thank God for fixing certain situations in my life. And he's still fixing certain situations. He ain't done. Pastor said, how many still looking for something from God? We still looking for something from God. God is a fixed God. So we turn to him for him to fix us. Amen. We have to continue to look forward to God to fix us. Amen. We're going to go through things. We're going to have problems. We're going to have situations. But we don't keep doing the same thing over and over again, purposely, then you're taking God's grace for granted. Amen? So we just want to continue to praise God. We're going to continue to lift him up. We're going to continue, Heavenly Father, Lord, to watch. Let him watch us, Heavenly Father, Lord. We thank you. Lord, continue, Heavenly Father, Lord. We give you all the praise and the glory, Lord. We know that our Father is a Father who will not lie. We know that he has nothing in him that will not go forth. And we just thank God. We say, anything that is in us, we want him to push it out. We want anything that is in us that is not of him, we want him to burn it out. We got to go back to the Lord, y'all. We got to get back to basics. We got to get back to the fundamentals. When we were back in Bible school, many of us was little small. We went to a certain church. We went to Bible study. And you had to go because mom and them took you. And you had to learn the basics. You had to learn the Lord's Prayer. You had to learn Psalms 23. Those basic things that we learned back then is what's going to keep us today. That doesn't mean that you doesn't grow, but you just keep those fundamentals, those basics, and those are the things that will keep us. Amen? So we thank God for the basics. We thank him for the fundamentals, and we just thank, give God all the praise and all the glory. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this time. I give God the praise and the glory. Amen. Thank you, Doc. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
every single time. What a mighty God we serve. Amen, amen. Thank you, my brother, for that message. That was powerful. I tell you, God really spoke through that word today. Amen. And pastor, thank you for sharing that word. I don't know about you, but I'm getting full on the word today. Thank you, Jesus. All week long, I've been in the word, and God just been speaking by his spirit concerning different things in our lives. I love that passage in Galatians to my brother. That's a very profound passage to really study. The whole book of Galatians is very inspirational when you get a revelation of who God is and what he's doing in your life. I'm going to go to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Hallelujah. But before I read that scripture, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord God, for this moment to share your word. Let it fall upon our hearts to bring conviction to our lives to change, to be more like you in our everyday living. Whatever's in our heart that we know about, God, we're going to ask you to take it out, God, to straighten us out in the mighty name of Jesus. Purify our minds and our hearts, oh God. Let your spirit have dominion and authority within us to sanctify our hearts and our minds by Christ Jesus. We give you glory, give you honor, we give you praise. And we bind every demonic force, every attack that will come against us because of this word. And we stand secure in your presence and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In, in the Second Kings, is a very interesting book when you read it. Many occasions of stories that have taken place dealing with the prophet Elijah and Elisha. But Elijah is a name that means my God is Lord. Amen. If you read the story of Elijah, how God used him to perform miracles. For instance, he met a widow who creditors were about to take her sons to pay a debt that her husband owed, but he had passed away. Not only this, it's the same one who told her, get some vessels, go borrow vessels from your neighbor and, and fill them with water. And because of God being with him, the water turned to oil and the vessels were filled he said, now go sell what you got and pay your creditors. If you know the account of Elijah, how Elijah is the one who defeated the 450 prophets of Baal, Satan worshipers. He had the power to tell them that my God is greater than your God that you serve. So I want you to fill some trench up, fill the trench, put some sacrifice in the trench. He set it on fire. Do whatever you want to do. And he talked about how God was so powerful, he licked up the trench to prove the magnitude of his power. And then Elijah told the priest, take all the prophets of Baal and kill them. This is the same one who was at the Jordan River, getting across over, took his mantle, and he struck the waters, the same Incidents in, in occurrence that when Moses was at the Red Sea, he got to him to stretch his rod. Elijah took his mantle, he struck the waters, and the waters departed. He was able to walk across on the other side on dry land. The same one who had a mentor, who was mentoring Elisha. Elijah was his predecessor. If you read the story, you find out that Elisha was, uh, was one of the prophets in training. But yet he had a heart to follow Elijah wherever Elijah went. He says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you stay, I'm going to stay. And Elijah said, you can go on back home. You got to go here. You got to go there with me. But he said, no, wherever you go, I'm going anyway. Because he said, I want something from you. If you read the story, you find out that Elisha wanted a double portion of Elijah anointing. 
Isn't that amazing? You can receive something from God. And my subject today, before I read the scripture, is my time for a miracle. Eric talked about, Minister Eric, but you got to go back to the manufacturer. Many times we get distracted by the things of the world because of sin and iniquity in our hearts. The Bible tells us the heart of man is wicked. We all know that. Look in the world. Look around in the streets. What you see? Wickedness. Where sin abounds, God says his grace much more abounds. You know what that means? Where sin is at its high peak, God says my grace from the sacrifice on the cross, he says it supersedes the sin that's abounding in society. That's powerful. I, I preach myself happy on that one. But when God showed this to me, he says, Elijah, a prophet of God, whose name means my God is Lord, came from Teshbe in Gilead, but nothing is known of his family or birth. We must meet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17 when suddenly appears unto Ahab. A evil king who ruled in the northern kingdom from 884 to 853 B.C. Elijah prophesied a drought to come upon the whole land as consequences for Ahab's wickedness. In other words, your deeds of sin will not go unnoticed in the eyes of God. Amen. Not only that. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we find the account where Elijah was summoned by a great man named Naaman. Read it, I'm going to read it first one. It says, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because, because by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. He was also mighty in valor, but he was a leper. If you know the story, when God gave Moses all the laws and decrees in the book of Leviticus, if you were a leper, you were considered an outcast. Because they would drive you from the city outside of the camp. And you were deemed unclean. So for this man to be in high rank position, but yet he had a defect in himself of leprosy. But it didn't stop him. And it says, verse 2, and the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy? So this is the maid. Syria had overpowered Israel. They took a maid from Israel and used him as their servant. So she goes to the mistress and says, my Lord has leprosy. Should I inquire of the prophets to go and come heal my master of his leprosy? Right? Let's go on a little further. Verse 4. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, thus says the maid of this land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go to, go and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. In other words, he wanted to pay for his healing. And he brought a letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter has come unto thee, behold, I have therefore sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man does send me to, uh, uh, send to me to recover 
uh, a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. So the king has a different interpretation of the letter that this is a trick. It's a trap. But it wasn't the case. Because Naaman, the commander, was, had a sincerity of heart. He wanted to be healed of his condition. One thing about this passage, it showed me something. That when we have a dilemma, a condition, a defect, a disability in our lives, and we don't inquire of the Lord to heal us, guess what happens? You stay in the same condition. Until you have a desire inside of your heart to want God to do something for you, God said, like the pastor said in the beginning of the service, open your mouth and praise him. Open your mouth, tell God what you want. Come on, release what's in you. Let go of the stuff you're holding on to. All those things will hinder you from receiving from the Lord. And so the commander sent this letter to the king of Israel. Hey, I want you to find this prophet. Because I want to be healed. Let's go a little further. And it was so. When Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. This is amazing. You got to really pay attention. There's some details in this. The letter sent to the king, the message got to the prophet. See how God operates? And it didn't say how the message got to him, but I believe there's a divine intervention where he heard the spirit of God tell him the king rent his clothes. And during that time, any time there was an offering for God where the people rent their clothes, that was in humility. To lay myself before God, God, I need your help. I can't do it myself. I can't fix myself. God, I need you to show up right now. Just like when Job, you read the story of Job, when Job got all the bad news and everything that can happen was happening, it said Job rent his clothes, he shaved his head, and he bowed down and worshipped. Can you worship when all hell breaks in your life? Can you worship when your life is falling apart, your family in confusion, the husband or wife left you, can you worship when your children disappear and they go on a strike? Can you still worship? Yeah. Glory to God. Getting ahead of myself. Getting ahead of myself. Hallelujah. So it says, and it was so when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel rent his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me. So in other words, go tell Naaman, come see me. God strategically plant prophets in his house because the prophets have a deeper connection into the spirit realm to reach God for the house. When God sends a prophet, he don't speak of his own accord. He speaks from the spirit of God. For what he hears God tell him to speak is what he will speak. Jeremiah puts it this way. He said, if a prophet prophesies, he said, if it comes to pass, let it be known it's not of us, but of God. But... If he prophesies and it does not come to pass, let it be known it was not of God, it was of us. See, we get it twisted because the prophet coming to the house say, I'm a mighty man of God, I'm a prophet, I got a word from the Lord. And it be prophesying in the house of God. God says, you need to get in your Bible and know when a prophet speaks a word because it lines up with the word of God. If I don't study the word of God, how can I know the word of God? A lot of us have the word of God sitting on our table in our house as a showpiece. So when people come to your house, oh, you're a Christian because you got a Bible sitting on your table. That ain't doing nothing but collecting dust. Woo. Glory to God. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the house of Elijah.
touch his door. So Naaman got the word. Check this out. This is going to blow your mind here. Naaman gets the word from the prophet. Come to his house. So he comes to the house, right? He said he stood at the door of the house. Check this out. Verse 10. And Elijah sent a messenger unto him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again unto thee and thou shalt be clean. It's my season for a miracle. However, Naaman gets an attitude. He says, verse 11, Naaman was wroth. I mean, he was intense in anger. He was mad. And he went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me. Ain't that something? You come to the prophet's house, but you don't believe in the prophet. How can I come to the house of God? Don't believe in his prophet. The Lord said, Believe in the Lord thy God and his prophet, so shall you prosper. If God says a prophet in the house, God is expecting you to have faith that the prophet is going to speak a word from the Lord to change your destiny. Glory to God. So behold, I thought he would surely come out of the house and stand and call on the name of his God and strike his hand over the place and, I, and recover the leprosy. He had a preconceived idea. How many folk in the house of God got preconceived ideas? about God. You don't want to seek God when the man of God tells you go home and pray. Go home, anoint your house, anoint your children. Whatever's going on in your house, begin to sanctify your house and cast out every spirit. No, I want the pastor to do it. I don't believe God's going to hear me, so I want the pastor to come to my house and anoint my house. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The same anointing inside of the shepherd is inside of you. Because you're connected to the shepherd, the same anointing trickles down to the congregation. That dunamis power. You can explode the devil's kingdom by speaking the word of God, acting in faith, anointing yourself with oil. But check this out. I'm almost done. He goes on. So are not a banner and parfa rivers of Damascus better than all the waters in Israel? So now he's questioning. The prophet gave him the order, go dip in the Jordan seven times. If you know Jordan, Jordan's a muddy water. It's a dirty water. So name it feel like I'm a man of esteemed quality. I'm too big to go down and dip in that nasty water. How many times you got pride in your heart in the house of God? The man of God tell you to do something. Your pride is not going to sit right here on my rump and dump and do nothing. Glory to God. So he says, I'm not the waters. If you study the history, the waters of Abana and Parfar were clean waters. There were water run different directions in Arabia, in Damascus, and in Syria. And it says, may I not wash them and be clean? Let me go a little further. He said, may I not wash them and be clean? And he turned and went away in rage. He was furious. I can't ex can't accept that word from that man of God. I can't, I can't receive that. No, I, I'm not going to believe that word. That, that, that ain't right. He wrong for that. Who, who do you think he is? Go tell me go dip in that nasty water. You, you lost your mind. You think I'm a man who got people under my command. I can tell them to come and go. They listen to me. Do what I say do. And you tell me go get in this nasty water. Reminds me of Jesus. When he met a blind man, and he said, he said he spit on the ground, made some clay out of mud, put it on his eye, so to go dip in the Jordan. The difference between the both, he went. This one complained. And the man received his sight after dipping two times. And he goes and says, and his servant came there and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee some great thing, 
wouldst thou not have done it? If the prophet said, you know what? I wish you go down to, to Syria, go meet the king of Israel, tell him this, and God going to really prosper you. If he had told you that, you, you would have done it. You would ask him. So how much rather then he said to thee, wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto him, the flesh of a little child. He was clean. If he had not been convinced to go down to the Jordan, he would have never got clean. God is speaking to the house today. Whatever your condition is, whatever your situation is, God says, I want you to act on faith. Begin to seek my faith. Consecrate your house. Get in the order of divine, the order of the word of God. Allow the word of God to manifest. And God said, your situation is shifting. Things are changing in the atmosphere around you. But the story doesn't end there. If you read the encounter of the whole story, you find out that Naaman, after obeying the prophet, he was grateful. Now I'm whole. That which once held me in captivity has now been stripped off from me. So now my skin is like a newborn baby. I can go forth in the promise God has for me but because of his heart, now I want to pay the man of God for what he's done. You cannot buy your healing. You cannot buy your miracle. You cannot buy your breakthrough. You can't allow the enemy to hinder you from obeying the truth. And because of his heart, Elijah had a servant who was with him. And his servant was Gehazi. And Naaman says to the prophet, I want to give you something for this miracle. Elijah turns it down. But then it goes on. It talks about as they begin to walk away, Gehazi turns back, goes back to Naaman and says, my master changed his mind. He wanted to take the offering anyway. But then he lied on the prophet. He lied to the man. Then he goes back to the prophet. And the prophet says, where you been, Gehazi? He says, oh, nowhere. Just went back uh, just to thank the man for receiving his healing and giving an excuse. One thing Elijah said that stood out the most in this whole chapter. He looks at Gehazi. He said the same lie you just told. He says, God knows it. He says, my spirit did not my spirit go with you. You can't lie to a real prophet without being exposed. You can't lie to the man of God without being exposed. Because God said, my eyes go to and forth through the earth to see everything under the sun. And I will render to every man according to his doings. So Gehazi, because of the iniquity, he allowed to enter his heart to lie on the man of God. Elijah said the same leprosy that was on Naaman is now come upon you. Because you have lied to God and to his prophet, you curse yourself. We have to be careful how we lie to God. The Bible says it's better not to make a vow than keep it. In other words, don't vow something to tell God, when I come to the church, God, I'm going to let you clean me up. God, I'm going to let you fill my life with your presence. God, I'm going to change. I'm going to change my attitude. I'm going to change my lifestyle. But then you leave out the doors, return to your vomit. Go back to your filth. Go back to your, your ways. 
that's not of God. And God says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and God will restore you. Why don't you stand out of the room? This is the message to make us aware of our hearts. What's in your heart today? What is it you're expecting God to do for you? I guarantee God is waiting on you. He's sitting there waiting on you to give him a command to show up. God is not going to show up until you give him the right to come into your life. One thing about God, he's not going to violate your will. He gives you the option to choose righteousness or choose death. He gives you the option to choose his presence or continue to live in sin. If you made a mistake, it's okay because we're humans. But one thing about God is I love you with an everlasting love. And by my loving kindness, have I drawn you to myself. But then the word says, if we confess our sins, be real with yourself. He's faithful. He remains faithful. He remains faithful. If you just acknowledge, God, I messed up. I made a mistake. Forgive me, God. He said, if we confess, that means open your mouth and tell God, God, I know I messed up. I know I should have did things I shouldn't have done. God says, you know what? If you confess your sins, I'm faithful. Not only that, I'm just. That word just means justified. As if you've never done no wrong. To forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord God, for this word. Pray that this word, O oh God, convict all of our hearts to want to change, to want to be more like you. Whatever area of our lives, O oh God, we've fallen short. Your word says, for all have fallen, have fallen short of the glory of God, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God, we ask you to forgive us right now, God. Come into our hearts. Purify our minds. Change our hearts. Change our lives. That we would be in position to receive our miracles, to receive our breakthroughs, to receive our deliverance. And we thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I want you to do me a favor and repeat after me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for giving me another chance. Now come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you